good to see all of you this morning. Good to see many of our members who made a decision to come to worship today. And we have a few visitors, too, and ask that you stay around a little bit. Let us get to know you. Uh, hopefully you can maybe meet me back in the floor. I'll be standing there. Uh, so thank you all for being here. First things first, uh, I just wanted to let this congregation know that boys' class, the young men training class we've been doing in the back, I just feel like it's been going really, really well. And I just want to kind of take this opportunity to tell y'all how much it means to me and how much it means to the young guys that a lot of you that don't have kids there, don't have grandkids in there, are still coming. And because the past couple of weekends, there's just been a great number that have turned out to listen to those young men's talks. Uh, and if you think about it, those young men back there and those young ladies that we have in here, that's going to be sooner than later the future. And they're going to be running things. And what better to encourage them now while we have these opportunities. So thank you so much for going back there and being there with them. Uh, the y'all do that I always do and go back there. And I think today, uh, I'm going to call y'all out. Samuel, you're going to do your talk. And Caleb, share it. You're going to do your talk, I think. And there's one more that's supposed to be doing their talk. Corbin. You're doing your talk. You with all you got out of it, didn't you? Because I forgot. Corbin Register is doing his talk. And so come and, and, and support them and see them do their talk. They're all going to do a great job. And I think you're going to take something from it. Uh, and so encouraging to them for being there. Something we've been talking about in boys class is thinking, keeping things to the point and keeping things simple and concise. And that's what we talk about. They get up there, they do, and we say, all right, what was the main point of so-and-so's talk? And so hopefully with this sermon, you'll be able to clearly get the main point from this sermon. And the one main point I'm trying to get you to take home with you is that you need to be eagerly waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. Eagerly waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. Because that's the way the first century Christians felt about the coming of Jesus Christ. They were eagerly waiting. So we're going to look at five passages, just five passages, and we're going to see how these people were eagerly waiting for the second coming of Jesus. If you'll indulge me for just a second here, imagine, and we don't know this, but imagine that Jesus Christ came and told us that right after we say the amen after this service, that he's coming back. He is coming back right when the amen is said. How does that make you feel? Or or maybe I can give you a little further one. If the Lord came and told you beforehand, I am coming back right after the amen Would you like me to keep that plan and come back then, or would you like me to delay my coming? How would you answer him? Would you say, Lord, no, come quickly, I'm eagerly waiting, or would you say, well, Lord, could you you give me a little bit more time? I think for us, if we're thinking about that seriously, there's probably three different emotions that we're feeling, three different attitudes, let me give them to you. There might be a group here, and hopefully there is, that would like that, and is all for Jesus coming back right when the amen is said. And they say, Lord, no, come on. They say, Andrew, get your sermon done quick and sit down because the Lord's coming back. Right? I think there's obviously another group of us in this room that know that you are not prepared to meet the Lord. And you would ask the Lord to delay his coming because you know you're not ready. And if you're under that impression, then you probably know what you need to be due to saved. I'm just going to leave it to you. You know what you need to do about that to be prepared when the Lord comes back when amen is said. What I want to focus on is this third group, maybe this third attitude. And it's the group of us that probably are Christians. We're confident confident in the Lord's ability to save us on the second coming. But we would still tell the Lord, you know what, Lord, give me a little bit more time. You know what, Lord, I really like Thanksgiving. And I like getting with my family. And and I've got plans for this November. Lord, can you come back after November? That would be a more convenient time. You know what, Lord, I just really, really like my life here. And would you at least give me the 80 years that most people get, or that some people get? Lord, would you just give me just some more time to enjoy my life here? I'd like to get married. I'd like to have kids. Lord, I'd like to have grandchildren. Would you just wait until I get to accomplish those things first? Or maybe even as simple as, Lord, I'd like to see Niagara Falls. Would you let me first go see Niagara Falls, and then you could come back? Is all that eagerly waiting? That's not eagerly waiting. Look at Philippians 3 if you're already there. We'll just pick up here in verse 20. Look what Paul says. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the workings by which he was able even to subdue all things 
to himself. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven whom we eagerly wait for the Savior who's going to come and transform our lowly body to be conformed to his glorious body. And we're going to spend an eternity with him in heaven. Are you eagerly waiting for that to happen? And let's look at our five verses, that being the first one there. Are we eagerly waiting or have we set our mind on earthly things? Are we a Christian that have set our mind on earthly things? If we look back at the top of verse 17 in this same passage, he talks about the opposite of those whose citizen is in heaven. Citizenship is in heaven. Verse 17, brethren, join in my following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of being eagerly waiting for the Savior, we could be doing this instead. Maybe we would tell the the Lord to delay His coming simply because we love this earth, and we want to spend more time on this earth. I think Paul mainly here is going from a sinful aspect of this. That you enjoy being in sin. And you know that when the Lord comes back, there is going to be no room for sin. Those that have not been received forgiveness from the Lord Jesus are going to be baptized by his fire of vengeance. As we see in 1 Thessalonians. Those that have not obeyed the gospel. And we understand that. We know about that. Let me take it to a whole other level here. Maybe a little bit deeper. Maybe more applicable to us in this room. Maybe it's not so much that you love sinful things. Maybe it's just that you just love earthly things. And it's those earthly things that are keeping you from eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord. Just to give you an example, I really enjoyed this week. Except for Saturday and this morning, you know, the weather was pretty nice, wasn't it? And hopefully you enjoyed that well. I enjoyed this week waking up early, going outside early, sitting on my back porch with my puppy Sophie and a cup of coffee. And I got to read some Bible out there. And it was pretty, it was beautiful, there were blue jays flying by, I'm getting my phone, taking pictures of the birds, you know. And then you look at the f- picture after and the bird's like this big, you can't even see it. But to me, you know, it was just beautiful. Are those bad things? Me enjoying the company of a coffee and my dog in the Bible? Absolutely not. But are those the same to being in company with the Lord Jesus Christ? They're not even comparable. And yet, I have become so comfortable in my own world here that I'm trying to tell the Lord to delay His coming. I've got my attitude backwards, don't I? I have my attitude backwards. I wonder if our own comfort is causing us not to be eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And we need to change our attitude about this. What about this? Are we not eagerly waiting simply because we don't feel prepared to meet Him? 1 Corinthians 1, if you turn there. Another passage where Paul uses the phrase eagerly waiting. Verse 4, here early on in the book, this is his prayer for the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. I thank my God, always concerning for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you came short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That eagerly waiting for the revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, we look at our context clues here, what is the revelation of Jesus Christ in this context? It's not the book of revelation of Jesus Christ, right? This is when Jesus is going to be revealed with his mighty angels on the last day. And when he'll take us again and make sure that we're blameless before him in Christ. Mr. Bill's been talking about this awful lot. And I think almost every Sunday night the past three weeks he's covered this at some point. Of us that are Christians and of us that are trying hard to please God, do you have confidence in your salvation? Do you have confidence in your salvation? Are you persuaded that Jesus Christ is able to save you on that last day? And I wonder if the reason why we're trying to delay the coming of the the Lord 
is simply because we're just scared of what that moment's going to be like. We're scared for him to return. He, we're scared for the sky to rip open. We're scared for him to descend in fire with his mighty angels, to descend the way that he ascended to the apostles. We're fearful of that. And it's because of our own weak condition. Well, look here in Corinthians what Paul says that the Corinthians have. He says he thanks God for them in verse 1, for the grace of God which was given to you. So you have the grace of God, the free gift from God. Verse 5, you've been enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge. We have been enriched in everything, meaning there is nothing that's lacking that you were missing somehow to not feel prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, that's this right here, we have the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's been confirmed. And now look in verse 8. When Jesus comes, he will also confirm you. And say, yes, this person right here, Andrew, he's been following me. I know who he is. Andrew, you're coming home with me now. And yet we read passages like this and we still yet have no confidence on that day. Well, ho- hopefully the Lord, will, the Lord will look at me. Oh, well, well hopefully... And then again, we're using that word hopefully to mean wishful thinking instead of the hope that has been confirmed by the testimony of Jesus Christ. If us that are Christians here and have been saved, let's have some confidence that the Lord Jesus is able to save us on that last day. Let's have some confidence in his word. Confidence that Jesus Christ does keep his promises. As well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. Here, this is going to break our tradition. We don't have the phrase eagerly waiting here. But after he describes the coming of the Lord Jesus, he tells us that how our attitude should be about it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then when we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And after explaining that, look what he says in verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In the context here, the people are asking the question about what of those in Christ that have died? You know, what's going to happen to them? And and Paul's trying to explain. And and even for us here at at Gardendale, we would still maybe have those concerns. What about those here that we've worshipped with and have encouraged us? And they've gone on. Well, what about them? Well, Paul gives his comfort. He says, don't worry about those that are asleep. Because when the Lord comes back first, he will raise everyone from the dead. And then we who are still alive will come and meet them in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll all be together. Something that keeps on getting me going. I get emotional every time Bill does it. Bill talks about it to me when we get together this week. We study about it. And he gets from the pulpit he talks about this. Y'all remember when Bill keeps on saying, imagine a room? Imagine a room where everyone in the body of Christ, everyone in the kingdom of heaven is there. The Lord's there. Hopefully you're there. Abraham's there. Moses is there. Rahab, the former harlot, is there. Is your granddaddy there? Maybe a Bible class teacher that taught you the gospel? Maybe some of your children that have obeyed the gospel? Maybe some of your cousins, maybe some people you grew up with, all these people from years and years ago that have all obeyed the gospel, they're all there. That's really going to happen one day. It's not going to be in a room. It's going to be together to meet the Lord in the sky. That's really going to happen one day. And how are we supposed to feel about that if we look in verse 18? Those are supposed to be comforting words. Those are supposed to be comforting words that he's going to come back. Right? We should be eagerly waiting for that moment. Let me pull a second thing out of this passage. I remember being very little, and I don't even know who I said it to, so don't ask. I was afraid of dying. And I told this person, who's a lot older than me, 
I, I don't want to die. I want the Lord to come back. And I'd rather go like that. And I was reprimanded it for having it wrong. Andrew, no, you don't want that. Andrew, that's going to be awful when the Lord comes back. You don't want to have to experience that. What's kind of ridiculous about that is, regardless if you're dead or not, we're all going to experience that, right? But having said that, I read this passage, and I may have been five, four years old when that happened, and now I'm 25, and that person who told me that, they got it wrong. Look at here, what's going to happen to those that are alive when the Lord comes back? Are they going to see death? It says they're going to just rise up to meet him in the air. That's what's going to happen to them. We talk about people like Elijah and Enoch. In Hebrews 11, what does it say about Enoch? That Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. And we talk about how wonderful and how awesome Elijah and Enoch were. That they had such a great relationship with our awesome God that the Lord just took them. And yet, we're going to be fearful on the last day because we're going to join the ranks of those like Enoch and Elijah that were just taken up. That seems backwards, doesn't it? We should be eagerly waiting for the Lord to come back. That would be a good thing to be taken up to meet those that have already fallen asleep in the sky. To be with our Lord, very similar, not in the same way, but similar to Enoch and Elijah. Let's look at our last passage here, our fifth passage. Hebrews 9. Here, a smaller one. In Hebrews 9, the Hebrews writer finishing up the differences between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The Hebrews writer says that the priesthood of Jesus Christ is better because Jesus has had to die once for all. Only one sacrifice was given, once. Instead of the Levitical priesthood, they had to continue to make sacrifices. Look at verse 27 of Hebrews 9. And as it appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. If you look at this last verse here, really the last sentence of verse 28. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. We've been talking about this eagerly waiting for the Savior. Is this all just a suggestion? Is this just a good attitude to have? It doesn't really matter if you have it. It should just be a nice thing. Well, here in this passage, who are those that are going to receive salvation? It's those who eagerly wait for the Savior. Those that are eagerly waiting are the ones that are going to receive salvation, right? And if you can think about this, I would hate for, again, back to our example, if after amen, if the Lord's coming back, for him to get here and see me and say, Andrew, you love this earth so much, and you love this world so much that you want me to delay, that, Andrew, you've just stopped eagerly waiting for me. You don't want me to be here. And we have gotten to a place where we don't want to be with Jesus, what kind of condition is our soul in? Our condition of our soul is a place that's away from Jesus. And ultimately, what I think that would lead to would be sin. If you love this earth so much, and it may start with simple things, like I said, like coffee and puppy and you know all this kind of stuff like this, that you have that to be your focus for your life, You forget about Jesus. You forget about your eternal soul. You forget about heaven. You don't think, well, my citizenship is in heaven. You think my citizenship is here in the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we get to watch baseball and TV. And that's what your whole life is all about. You've stopped eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ. And then that day is going to come, and you're going to be disappointed. Because your confidence has no longer been put into the grace of Jesus Christ, you've now put your confidence in your own life and in your own material. What parable does this work with? This parable works, excuse me, this works with the parable of the rich man who built his barns. He loved the world so much, he loved his wealth so much, he said, I'm going to just build me up some barns. And then the Lord comes to him and says, Tonight, O fool, your soul will be required of you. That could be said to us if we're not eagerly waiting for the Savior. So let's watch our attitude about this. 
And let's make sure we constantly have the attitude that we would be eager for Jesus Christ to come back, regardless of how good things are here on this earth. Because obviously the next life is going to be so much better. In John 14, too, Jesus tells the disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told, not told you. I go to prepare a place for you. It's one of my pet peeves when people tell me what we're going to do in heaven. And when people are just being excited about it, I don't care. You know, if we're excited about going somewhere, going, doing something, and people like to talk about it, I don't have any problem with that. What bothers me is sometimes we'll, some people go, well, Andrew, we know we're going to be doing this in heaven. And they don't have a Bible passage for that. In reality, there's only a few things I know about heaven. You know, I know God's going to be there. I know God's people are going to be there. I know it's going to be a place we're going to consider to be home. That's about it. That's all that the Bible, I, if I understand, tells us about heaven. To take that and bookshelf that for just a second, a lot of us here in this room have a bucket list. And what does that mean? It's things we want to do before we kick the bucket, before we leave this earth, right? That's what our bucket list is. And don't take this to a level that it doesn't belong, but and I think it's fine to say, you know, hey, there's some things I want to do while I'm here on this earth. Let's make a list. I'm, I have no problem with that. I do get a little worried, though, when sometimes, even out of my own mouth, we'll say things like, well, you know what? Before I die, I want to go see Niagara Falls. Before I die, I want to go hike the Appalachian Trail. Before I die, I need to go see this and this and this and this. Who made all that stuff? Did not God make all that stuff? I don't know what the design of heaven looks like, but I do know the designer. Who's going to go prepare a place for us? Jesus said he was going to go and play, prepare a place for us. If the God of heaven and earth that made all the beautiful things that we see around us, don't you think he can make something more beautiful to look at in heaven? That could be his own face for all I know. So when we worry, oh, I need to see this, I need to do this on the earth, I need to do this first. Don't you think there's going to be greater and better things in the next life to come? I do not know about the design of heaven, but I do trust the designer. And that's why I eagerly wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why don't you do too? If there's anyone here, though, however, is not prepared, and you do not want the Lord to come when amen is said, and it's because you know that you're in sin, <laughs> Thankfully, the Lord Jesus is trying to offer you his grace freely. If you're willing to have that broken, contrite heart, and you're willing to come and be baptized into the waters of Jesus Christ, please let us help you. The last thing I want to do is to be caught up in the air and look and see that you're not there. We want everyone in this room to be there. Please let us help you if we will come forward as you stand. Excuse me. If you will come forward as we stand and as we sing.